Al-Qaeda University Center for the Study of Islam and Society. And this is a lecture series of Lucy's. And uh, one of the goals of, of this lecture series is to connect with all scholars in the university and scholars and students and all the people interested in Islam and society. Because Islam and society are a topic that we study widely within our university. Uh, it is an interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary study. So we want to show uh, and present to you all the nice uh, studies, nice uh, uh, perspectives that we have. And today we are very proud to have uh, Professor Tahir Abbas. Uh, Professor Abbas is a very renowned scholar on radicalization, uh, Islamic extremism. Uh, since his uh, PhD dissert uh, dissertation in 2001 in Warwick, uh, you have been traveling uh, quite a lot around the globe at very prestigious universities uh, where you were uh, a position or a university scholar. You have uh, uh, published a series of books on the topic. And today you will be talking about your latest book on countering violent extremism. And you uh, promised me, or you said to me yesterday, that you're going to make a provocative statement. And so I'll call it. Uh, I will not uh, uh, keep you all in vain waiting and uh, give the floor to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you all kindly for, uh, for being here, for taking time out. And uh, I'd like to give me this opportunity to share with you some of my insights, observations, research uh, for however long now. On this, and uh, and uh, to explore also some of the concerns that are occupying me at the moment in relation to the Drive project. So we have this wonderful PowerPoint slide that highlights the Drive project, which is a uh, Horizon 2020 uh, research innovation action grant that started last year. I'm the scientific coordinator. We have uh, 21 researchers across five countries exploring the role of social exclusion in understanding fire rise and Islamist extremism. Across Northwest Europe, and Northwest Europe here being the Netherlands, Denmark, Norway, and the UK. And our uh, immense task is to interview 640 people across the, these four countries, and uh, whichever way we can, given today's limitation. And uh, and we, we, we aim to also introduce a public mental health intervention, which is uh, part of the, uh, the intervention aspect of the design of the project. So this is what we are uh, doing. You can learn more about this project from driveproject.eu, from our Twitter account, to follow, share, like, subscribe, etc. Let me move on to the next slide, if I may. So today I'm going to talk about, well, this fight so was... With the four countries, I have... Uh, yeah, the yeah, so, was too quick for me. <laughs> the Netherlands, we start with the Netherlands, the yeah. centre of the world, yeah. and uh, we move to uh, Denmark, yeah. Norway, and the UK. Okay. They're all, it's a tiny archipelago, and they were very, very close by. It is great to hop around on planes in, but uh, obviously in COVID times, we only met twice as a consortium. Mm -hmm. So that, that creates all sorts of tensions and uh, considerations around how we get things done and uh, make science, as it were. Nevertheless, we should try one, uh, despite all our, all our uh, differences. So I was asked to talk to you about my work, and in particular this focus on extremism and radicalization. And so I came up with this title, which is related to my recent uh, book, which is entitled Counter Violent Extremism. And the idea there, having uh, been at Leiden now for about three odd years, teaching security studies with master's students is to try and rethink what students and radicalization means for students who come from a perspective of solve the problem, uh, uh, put bad people away, that, that, that somehow there is a serious issue to do with ideology, and that, it, that this is an immediate, urgent, or wicked concern. And, and, and this seems to be the preoccupation of a lot of our students. We have 300 or so folks on our master's program. But uh, as a sociologist, somebody who's been working at the uh, uh, chalk face of understanding ethnicity, politics, identity, I have a very different perspective on extremism and radicalization. But rather, it's very much a critical perspective, which is quite consistent with a lot of other academics working in this area. It's not as if uh, anything I say here is entirely original. There are many scholars at the, the fringes of departments of politics, media, community, uh, law, criminology. And sociology in particular, they talk about a critical perspective. And what is the critical perspective? Well, we want to try and move away from the dominant state-centric, top-down, uh, 
focus on CDE and PDE and all of the different manifestations, radicalization, de-radicalization. These are in many ways industries that mushroomed. When we see uh, instances of, of, of extremism and, and radicalization, particularly, for example, in the, in the UK, when we had events of 77, so four British born chaps basically uh, blew up three tube trains and a bus uh, in July 2005. 70 odd people died, 500 odd people were maimed, injured, some for life. And so serious questions were being asked what could the cause all this? What's behind the, this outcome? What, can we do to better understand it? At the time, there were people who talked about what these Blair's blowback, quote unquote, that if you go around uh, evading uh, illegally uh, countries such as uh, the, uh, the country of Iraq, it's going to create implications, ramifications for issues back home. Back home in places like Europe, in, when we talk about uh, uh, Europe, we're talking about France predominantly, but also the UK. And, and obviously, that was a little bit. Uh, insensitive perhaps it could be said but it was very much on people's minds and at the same time we had to be careful about what we say especially for british muslims people who are born in, in england have an islamic muslim uh, ethno-cultural heritage as part of migration history and they are suddenly in a position of having to be made to choose between being muslim or being british and somehow this, this is incompatible that these are two opposing forces and some of that rhetoric and uh, some of those narratives have been sort of dialed up in the post 9 11 period. And we've talked about extensively 20 years after 9 11, 20 years into the war on terror, and where we are still trying to understand what causes radicalization, how to deal with it, and, and why we are not getting really very far with things like CDE, which is the dominant paradigm. So, maybe you want to write this book because I was trying to uh, teach the students that there are wider historical, social, cultural, political issues that we have to think about and be sensitive about and try to understand extremism radicalization as we see it today. It's not about locking up bad people just like that. We have to do other things to better understand these issues. So CVE itself is a phenomenon that has taken shape in the light of UN action plans and very much a US-led type of initiatives. But now almost every country is required, required to produce national plans, actually delivery plans in accordance with these ideas of Counter violent extremism. But what is it to counter violent extremism in practice? And more often than not, it's about understanding real world issues of development, inequality, identity loss, status loss. And in almost every instance, we're looking at issues of push and pull, but we're also looking at individual level triggers. Uh, for example, you have the same sort of push factors and the same sort of pull factors being operationalized in any one setting, but not everyone with those particular variables at play, will tip into extremes, and there are always going to be individual level uh, concerns. So uh, how do we counter it? Uh, what do we do to counter it? Um, and how do we better uh, appreciate it? Well, I start my talks with my students by saying Islam is a religion of peace. That's what the word means. And it will shock students who sort of only hear about Islam through the lens of television, media, Hollywood, uh, popular television programs, debates. Where there's always a framing around extremism and radicalization. There is the idea of the wider historical contribution of Islam into Europe and how Europe and Islam effectively have shaped each other over a period of 1400 years is, is somewhat uh, oblivious to many of my students. And also, the other thing is that we often talk about um, when we have our history lessons the Greeks, the Romans, then the Enlightenment, Renaissance, and so on. But the 750 years in the middle gets missed out. But there is a question of Islamism in history, and we have to look at this through our uh, historical appreciation. There's plenty of documentary uh, historical material to support this. And we've got these key lines, so basically that fearism uh, and the idea of um, Muslims killing other Muslims in the name of Islam, which is effectively how a lot of this uh, started. And we see also that operationalized today when most of the victims of extremism in the Muslim world are indeed Muslims. It's often Muslim or Muslim violence. So we see these paths as uh, key moments in the sort of historical travel of the problem of extremism, taking various manifestations. But in almost all these cases, there are external factors to consider. These haven't emerged in a vacuum. The Mongols were basically attacking at the same time as the Crusades were very much in, in play. So what this did to the Abbasids was, was to 
instead of having these uh, madras, uh, these sort of Islamic institutions, these wakats, which are science and, and uh, sort of research-based institutions, they transform them more into, into uh, madrasas. And, and the idea of a holy war was in response to the idea of a holy war. Uh, similarly, uh, with um, what we see during the colonial period, remember 18th century the Muslim world was under the colonial yoke. Um, Turkey also had an interesting relationship with Europe, uh, and there was an element of, of cultural secularization that was uh, sort of mimicking some of those European norms and values of enlightenment. But at the same time, most of Turkish society is still very traditional. And, and, and so these inequities have remained and continue to play. And over the last 20 years with the AKP and what they've been able to do with mobilizing the Islamic bourgeoisie, they've tried to reverse some of this uh, politically and culturally with still ongoing tensions. So uh, these historical periods are very important because I think these are flashpoints in trying to understand the language, the appreciation of, of these issues, all the way to the, the, the sort of the colonial period and the post-colonial period. Um, and when we talk about extremism, we have to think about also the formation of Israel, 1948, that was born out of terrorism in many ways. The idea of state terrorism uh, is also related to that particular period in time. We see state terrorism very much happening across the world, but in terrorism studies classes, it's not the first thing you learn. Uh, you learn about uh, the French Revolution, and you learn about the, the sort of propagate the the, uh, the, the propagation of the deed itself rather than the contextual factors involved. So all the way to, from uh, if, uh, the Mongols all the way to Ibn we get to what is the kind of, to quote the Salafist, nihilist uh, against death cult, uh, Islamic State, what was Islamic State, um, formed as the rebel, Sunni rebel movements that were mobilized against the Assad regime until they were, uh, uh, well, the head of the state was beheaded in 2019, but we still see elements that linger across Iraq, Syria today. And there are issues of uh, extremism in Iraq, Syria today. And, and again, it's some of the same problems that were always in play at the time destabilization, development, corruption, inequality, um, uh, nepotism. And um, yeah, these are the kinds of things that lead to ethnic, cultural. Uh, Conflicts and of course remote villages out in the, in, into the, 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 the outer areas of Iraq, Syria, etc., are ungovernable, and there are people they are susceptible to to uh, uh, crops going bad, all the way to um, uh, problematic landlords, as well as bureaucracy and securitization state that the uh, ordinary Iraqis and Syrians continue to face. And these are enough structural factors to push people into extremism. As a means to an end. And in some cases, we also think about uh, extremism in organizations such as Islamic State as an opportunity to, uh, where there are where there's a job for people who could speak Arabic, French, pro program a MacBook Pro. It was $5,000 a month salary, which is not available in Tunisia or even to second or third generation Maghrebi um, descendant uh, French, uh, Moroccans, and, and beyond, etc. So there is this. Period uh, we need to understand, but it's all uh, needs to be contextualized and understood in its historical period. Okay, so um, and then all of this is also related to where we are today in terms of the Muslim experience. So, think about 80% world under colonial rule, and then we see that uh, there has been shared norms and values between European and uh, uh, Islamic heritage. But architecture, think about any time you see a sort of an arch in a church or in Mark Square in Venice or, or the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, these are influenced by Islamic art and architecture, by the way. Um, and the idea of Renaissance and so on, we know all of these from our textbooks, uh, the Rush and Ibn Sina, how they were able to help shape some of those ideas. So that's important in terms of shaping what Europe became and, and what Islam has become in the post, post colonial period. Let's flash forward to the end of the Second World War. We need a bunch of people to come to our countries in order to help reconstruct. And in some cases, it was to go back to the col once colonized, or still colonized, or at the end of the colonized period, countries, in this case, in, in the UK case, we're talking about South Asia, to come and work in the low skill, low paid jobs uh, that nobody else wanted to do because they were higher aspirations and so on. In, in, the, in the Dutch case, Moroccans were invited to take part in the uh, 
um, manufacturing and industrial sectors were streamed. So if, if uh, 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 Moroccans could speak French, that they were denied a visa because they could be seen as somehow being able to organize themselves. And through that language discourse, historical experience, um, they didn't want that to happen. We saw how unions in the UK stopped African Caribbean and South Asian workers from coalescing and working together against the, the exploitative practices of employers in the industrial sectors of the economy. At the same time, the national political logic was let's get them into our countries, but let's make them like us. We being this indivisible unitary whole known as English society, British society, and if they're like us, they won't be any problems. But soon racism popped up. Racism is as old as history in many ways, but the kind of modern racism we talk about relates to, to the European expansion, the age of discovery, and also the age of slavery. Britain was one of the most uh, uh, successful slave uh, economies, if you like, in the world. And because of slavery, and then beyond that, in terms of colonialism, in terms of specifically India, it became what it did in terms of uh, one of the most powerful empires of the world. And Obviously, geography plays a role, access to the seas, etc. Fast forward to the post war period, we find people who are introduced and invited into the UK economy, but also the German most manufacturing economies, here to in the, in the Dutch guest working system, to work in factories, to work in, uh, in industrial spaces, and ultimately they will go home once the jobs are finished. That didn't happen. Um, racism appeared. And people decided to stay, and they could stay. And in many cases, as citizens, they had every right to do so, despite all attempts to, to remove the possibility of securing citizenship, and then later on, preventing primary migration altogether. And we see some of that racialized logic in terms, in terms of today's uh, well, market for, a, for higher education, when we charge so much more for the same courses to people with a dark skin. But the ge geographical location they are, us, the more we charge. And this is something that came about in the 1980s under Thatcherism. Yes, we, we want to expand the higher education sector, but this is also a way of marketizing it. Simulation, integration, racism, all of the, uh, sorry, integration, uh, anti racism were all tried and tested and all failed because racism, a bit like capitalism, has a way of reinventing itself. Uh, and that's, that's something to think about even today. So the, these problems of exclusion, racialization, othering, disadvantage, which are economic, political, social, cultural, were exacerbated by the events of 9 11. Uh, we, we know what happened. The, the attack caused a, 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 quite a significant reaction. People didn't say very much about the invasion of Afghanistan at the time, but it was still made very much about trying to remove uh, people who were at the center of a plot, but attacking the entire nation. And similarly, the uh, so the new American century bomb already had plans for Iraq, even as uh, uh, Afghanistan had really top taken off. And Iraq was an illegal invasion based on the, the, the uh, ever impossible to find because it didn't exist weapons of mass destruction. Was the term, was it weapons of mass destruction. That's also related. <laughs> um, so that's the geopolitics going on in the post war period at the same time as the Muslim minorities are finding themselves experiencing all sorts of downward social mobility pressures, exclusion, disadvantage, and so on. Okay, let's go on. Um, so what then causes, so we've got these problems and these parallels, so what then causes an individual to take part in an extremist organization, go all the way to suicide bomb or terrorism, uh, or getting engaged in plots in other parts of the world? It's a combination of push and pull. There are push factors, which are about people feeling a lack of identity, a sense of opportunity, a sense of citizenship, and there are pull factors of the ideology, the idea that somehow a, a internalization of a, a, a radicalization model will fix all the world's problems is something that is very much there. There are different personality types who are uh, encouraged by this, and this is not weak minds, this is also strong minds. It's not as if it's something about uh, it's purely psychological on its own can be understood. But we also need that trigger factor. There always has to, there always has to be something else at the level of the individual that takes people over. And this is trauma, this is stories of people's friends or relatives who are picked up or given a very harsh treatment by the criminal justice system, which, which mobilizes people further. And so there are these 
uh, various factors in, in play because otherwise we'd see a lot more of it if we focused entirely on push, critical factors, the critical sort of terrorism scholars talk about push factors in, in considerable ways. The orthodox terrorism studies uh, scholars talk about the pull factors, and if you somehow reverse ideology or re-engineer it, we stop the problem altogether. But that, of course, doesn't work, uh, and we have had various attempts to try and make that happen, uh, uh, including the CBE model. Well, the CBE model has some aspects of understanding the push elements into it, but it's still nevertheless a state-centric, top-down model of, of trying to understand the problem down solutions. Are. It's also very ethnocentric, so global north models are seen to apply in the global south uh, because they're fashioned in the image of the global north. And that also leads to additional uh, uh, divides, if you like. Now, it's interesting that we're thinking a lot more about mental health today. Um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, when these suicide bombers in, the, in London carried out their attacks, nobody wanted to talk about mental health or uh, psychological problems. But when we see the far right becoming more of a concern, and the far right are more of a concern now than ever, this is not just in terms of radical politics, which is about political participation of people like UKIP. Um, also, we see it in, in cases of its links to conspiracy theories, it, its uh, problems within the, the uh, armed forces. We have cases galore in, in Canada, the UK, and Germany of members of far right groups coming from serving armed forces. And, and there's something going on there that needs to be. Uh, better understood than we're, we're trying to make time. So the far right uh, experience in recent periods has given us more of a lens on mental health because I think we've taken much more <laughs> efforts to do this, whereas before we were quite dismissive or just simply negligent of it. But this is all obviously within the, the framing of a certain media uh, narrative, the narratives. When um, Tarrant, Brendan Tarrant, carried out the Christchurch attacks, killing 51 people during Jamal prayers. People you know, shot in the back while they were praying. So the door front open, of course, that's what mosques do, and the doors front of the front door open. Um, it, was, it was headlines such as, you know, well, how could a beautiful blonde boy become so? This is a, a, a sort of a, a one, one in a sort of million situation where it's nothing to do with something more systematic. Uh, or these are lone actors, which is also a, a phrase that tends to get bounded about within the terrorism industry, if you like. There are no lone actors as such. These individuals who get radicalized online are not operating alone. They're operating in an echo chamber. They're operating in forums and discussion groups. They are learning the tactics. They are sharing the techniques. And they are uh, reinforcing their own logic around these uh, ideals and outcomes. And so again, some more development is needed on how we understand. And part of the project, uh, the dry project, is to try to understand how people get into extremism but given their real-world social exclusion issues and experiences and outcomes, and what happens online in terms of what they engage with, what their level of interaction is, what kind of discourses they buy into and, and help uh, evolve. So another way of trying to think about uh, the problems is to understand that there are these uh, security, suspect security paradigms. So with, with Muslims, we see similar parallels that happen with the Irish community in the 70s in the UK. That, uh, because of the, the Republic of Troubles, the, the idea that the Irish communities who came to the UK in the 50s, again, Ireland was the first place colonized by, by England, in some ways it still is, and um, they were deeply racialized and excluded, even though they were white and Christian. Racism isn't just about color. But nevertheless, in the 1970s, we have this idea of the suspect community paradigm. And that comes into play when we think about prevent Prevent is one of the four planks of the UK contest strategy, and it's, it's a front-facing, community-oriented model where you effectively communities are expected to spy, spy on their own communities. And this means everything from reporting uh, to um, informing, both formally and informally. And also this prevent duty has been enacted to about 50,000 public sector organizations, at least social work, hospitals, schools, universities, introduced the prevent duty. So I'm sitting in front of a class and I see one of my students, it's been it's longer, and he's reading a Bilafi the Green Book, I'm really worried about this situation, I can report you, and you would have to be then um, faced, uh, put in front of a panel to, uh, to discuss what's going on. And what does that do? It, it, it makes you, the individual, uh, even more fearful about talking about what's on your mind. 
you're on a university campus, for goodness sake. Nothing should be taboo. Every subject should be debatable. Uh, and then it creates the trauma and the isolation and the alienation and forces people to the extremism. It, has, it does the job of turning people to the extremism, which is the exact opposite of it. Bruce Payton, who just published this in Race Ethnicity in Education, where we talk to 159 Muslim students in university campuses in the UK, um, they get to talk to us about what's driving them uh, away and into self isolation and into self um, censoring and, and being wary about how they wear their clothes and what kind of, how long their beards are in case they are uh, reported by their colleagues, by their professors. And this is on university campuses in 2019, 20, that we, when we did this uh, study. Um, so there are these um, issues there around the media framing. We also have you know, this constant sort of gender stereotypes also related. I'll just take this for four or five minutes, where, where the brown man is dangerous, and brown woman is vulnerable. And this is again back to the kind of orientalist colonial logic that still plays itself out today. Even if Afghanistan was all about let's save the women from the from the, the men, uh, and then let's save them from Islam. It's, it's again not, nothing very original about all of this. Let's go on. Uh, there are these layers of uh, extremism, also understanding how people frame how they see their problems, and we can see it at the level of location. Locality at, at the very immediate location for a person, immediate orbit. And then we talk about also the, the wider problems of the national framing of Muslims. Muslims equals extremism, Islam equals terrorism. These are the constant discourses. We have a prime minister who's published articles talking about Muslim women and headscarves as, as bank robbers or letterboxes. And then the next day, uh, uh, crimes against women are up 350%. This is reported crimes. A lot of crimes are not reported because nothing happens. Uh, in terms of policing responses. And then we still have, uh, we, we can look at France as a, a neighbor uh, about, in terms of uh, Zamora and some of the language that he's deploying in order to try and fight for the presidency. It's even more extreme than uh, Marine Le Pen could ever have fashioned. And, and, and even Macron has tilted to the right in order to keep abreast of the, the changing popular discourses shaped by, by, by media. And in, in some cases, there is an ongoing normalization called pass the dinner table test. It's okay to be Islamophobic because that's the norm almost everywhere, certainly in parts of the media. And of course, the global war on terror continues, even though we've dropped the name. And then we still go out uh, and fix these problems elsewhere. Um, the case in, in France with, with uh, national security measures at one level at home, um, shutting down mosques, including, including the uh, Paris, Paris mosque. Uh, deporting imams at the same time as operation, CDE operations in Mali, military-led campaigns to eat out extremists. It's a kind of multifaceted situation. And war is no big business. Yesterday, um, a couple of days ago, when uh, the uh, current head of the Islamic State uh, was uh, decapitated, it was at the same time as Biden was at the lowest on the opinion polls in the US. And the next day, talking in the media about Biden as a national hero. And, uh, what a great leader he is. So yeah, we have to be cynical. We have to be uh, uh, understanding that there are these political issues and layers at the same time. Let's go on. Uh, so it's a social problem, not a religious problem, a theological problem. They, so when we have these terrorist attacks in the UK and in France, the people who do this are made in France, in Britain. They're not made necessarily in, in, uh, in camps elsewhere, although there are some issues historically of training people who've gone over to even Kashmir, for example, to get trained and come back. But in most cases today, especially with the internet, you don't have to leave your neighborhood in order to be radicalized. You don't have to go very far to pick up the instruments you need. Although everything is, is monitored, digital footprints, financial footprints uh, are monitored and uh, screened, surveilled. And the easiest thing to do in terms of policing security intelligence is to take everyone's data and then backuply search and find because it's cheaper that way. Uh, it definitely not miss anything out. So for sure, all this information that we have that is digital is almost permanently recorded. So we can think about the political aspects, the sociological, the criminological ideas around this, and we also have to understand that there are yes, definite cases of internal issues, and we talk about the internal issues as well. There is religious misinterpretation. That's all about capacity. 
that's all about organization. I've been trying to look at experiences in Europe now that I've been here of Moroccan uh, folks in Europe, France, and, and, and the Netherlands, compared with the Turkish folks with similar migration histories. We don't see Turkish folks involved in Gagetian in extreme Europe. We do see Moroccan second, third generations. So why is that? Well, it's to do with the structural realities that both communities face, but there is a certain kind of religious organization among the Turks that isn't always there for, for Moroccan communities. And that, that comes out of Turkey with the Yenids uh, and the Imams who are trained over there and sent here, and also the political mobilization of parties here as well. And, and, and the Moroccan communities only recently started doing that. And so it's been much more fractured and much more disconnected in that respect, and therefore the diasporic identities have been even more fragile, and therefore vulnerable to, to issues. And of course, both sets of communities experience criminalization, problems with exclusion, social housing, and employment. Poor health is also part of this. It's not accident that we see higher death rates among Muslim minorities uh, uh, than compared to others three, four times as high, because it's not nothing that's to do with genetics, it's more to do with poverty factors, and also exclusion, historical exclusion factors, within health services. So back to society, back to structure, back to all of these different layers. Now I said something about prevent, probably running out of time, but prevent is hugely criticized. It's been around since 2006 formally, 2003 informally. It makes problems worse for a lot of people. But there is plenty of people in the, in the same way there are those in the CBE world who use prevent as a, as a way to uh, police, securitize, surveil, to keep the discourses to even even think that um, there is a, that it actually works. I've had conversations with people who are senior folk within Prevent. Yeah, Prevent was great. We stopped um, we stopped three hundred people from going to Iraq, Syria. Yeah, but what about eight hundred who did go to Iraq, Syria while this Prevent program was going on? Uh, how do you explain all of that? Um, and uh, and of course, at first it was secret. The government didn't admit that it was going on. Um, and well, it has been. Certainly, informally, at least from 2003 onwards, right after the war on terror. And it's also a way of stopping so, you know, Muslims on campus who want to raise their hands in class and say, Yeah, but what about foreign policy? Uh, you know, they think twice about raising those hands in case they are labeled as extremists. Even I also sometimes have to be careful. Uh, my, my Jewish colleagues and secular liberal colleagues say what they like, and it's okay, but I have to be super careful as well. But it's okay now, recently secure. <laughs> Let's go on. Um, this Demonus um, element is very important for uh, the drive project. So this is the idea of reciprocal radicalization. The one group's radicalization is somehow fed off by the radicalization the one the other group in relation to them. There are these binary distinctions that are common to both. With the them and us the bio, they tend to be mutually reinforcing, although the, it's asymmetrical. Sometimes we see that the far right are, are, don't, are not there to, to mobilize against Muslims necessarily, but we do see some of this uh, very much going on in the discourse and language of uh, many of the attacks, the, the, the manifestos of bribing, the tariffs, etc. Talk about the great replacement, uh, talk about kebab removal, etc. Like and, and we see in the radical right politics, for example, the EDL, the English Defence League, walking in towns with their marches, holding Christian crosses, uh, using Christian symbolism uh, to. to push their ideas forward. But there are, I think, both are uh, problems in terms of social cohesion. Both are also linked to masculinity, but we can't um, assume that women are not involved in extremism and radicalization, that they have their own agency of women in this. So that's something to think about as well. We don't have to overly generalize around gender. We do see that the economic division, so if we were to look at sort of analysis of the tax combined with an analysis of polarization, both economically and politically, we can see that there are some, uh, some parallels there. But we do see that there are these patterns of segregation. So 300 of folks who went to Islamic State from the Netherlands did so from one of the suburbs in The Hague. Okay, so that happens to be the most ethnically concentrated suburb in the whole of the country. Okay, it's, a, it's two broad facts, uh, and their relationships between them can, they need to be broken down, but there is something there. Um, and we see also in cases of white far right groups, use broad there, are also from ethnic majority 
monocultural, monoethnic communities where there are these downward patterns of deindustrialization. We see, for example, the rise of the Gida in Eastern Germany, where they've seen the flow of capital to West Germany and all the talent and all the brains and what's left behind doesn't get much from the state and the center. Uh, we also see some of the more remote areas of the Netherlands where we see pockets of fire rate activity. It's not an urban phenomenon in the same way that it's slow as it is, that's because this was already in these urban areas, but it's because of this sense of isolation and exclusion and disability in rural areas or less populated urban areas that we see the far right. I said you're almost ready. Sorry? I said you're almost ready. I don't well, want to push, but. Uh, yeah, almost ready. And the challenges ahead are that. Um, we think about um, populations in terms of, so there is the population asymmetric growth pattern because of uh, just the, the birth rates and so on, and the uh, majority of populations are not reproducing as fast. There is this uh, problem also of the political framing of populism, authoritarianism. France is shifting further to the right, um, although uh, Germany is now led by a socialist, uh, yeah, Polish, which is interesting, the rest of Europe is always. Britain and Brexit, I could go on for Brexit for hours. Um, that's also a right wing populist, authoritarian, semi racist, if not fully racist, uh, uh, discourse that has no bearing whatsoever in economic reality. And, and here we are, uh, the dominant media discourses are overwhelmingly hostile, and uh, we still have uh, a long way to go. So, this is where the dry project is in play. Where right with the month uh, or well, in February uh, 2022, we've got into the seventh of the end of the year to do our work. We want to try to get an understanding of what's happening there geographically, locally, the, the sons of Odin, all the way to um, the, almost the biological origins of the Dutch and British that go way back, uh, many centuries back. So, what's happening in this part of the world? And after five years of uh, luckily life in Istanbul, I wanted to try and life in colder countries, and well, here I am. So, sorry for running over, but I thought it'd be good to kind of elaborate on some of these themes. Thank you for your attention. I hope some of it stuck together, and I look forward to your comments. Well, thank you very much for, for your very, very rich and very fascinating presentation. And that, um, I, I now also fully see how, how complex the, the, the study of radicalization is. It is so many variables involved at multiple levels and and sometimes the outcome that you want to see is to predict that single individual who's going to do this this attack um so it's very fascinating i still have one 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 question and and, and uh to open up the floor and that's why i'm abusing my position as a moderator to ask the first question is that you alluded to it but uh you didn't uh, don't you don't seem to go into it in this project and that's the role of the the the, 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 the the countries of origin, especially the states of origin. Uh, what I will start me is that, that um, uh, in the countries Turkey, uh, Morocco to some extent, uh, Morocco and all, they are especially with the classical uh, classical Islamic state tradition. Um, maybe Turkey more than, than, than Morocco. Uh, they were aware, and as far as I understand, and that's it's, and I see this that an Islamic state, classical Islamic state. There's this high culture of Islam, and and and, and generally uh, the, uh, the elites perceive Islam, the religion, to be too dangerous to leave it leave it to the, to the individuals. So we have these state structures controlling religion, defining what's the form of religion, and then you have these religious orders, the Tariqat, they are uh, there to do some uh, regulating at all. But it seems to me that that in a sense that there's also this individualization of radicalization is some kind of failure of the Islamic State here. Uh, and, and, and Turkey, does the Turkish government try to do with the Ahmed to, to also uphold some of the Islamic State control uh, thing, but uh, in, in, in other ways not. So is it also, this, is it really individualized? Do our Muslims now really, uh, when they're radicalized, uh, lost from, uh, from, uh, from their Islamic State background? Or? Yeah, I think there's, there's something interesting there, and I, you're right, I didn't focus too much about this because I'm really interested in kind of the lived experience here. But of course, the lived experience here is also shaped by, by forces outside, uh, in the sense of the, certainly when we think about the Turkish communities, and I'm trying to understand the differences with this project uh, in, in Dusseldorf. We've got almost the same identical community in terms of population and socioeconomic profile, but very different outcomes in terms of religious organization. So it does matter. There is, there is a sense of organization that is a form of protection. Form of security, uh, which is internal and it's robust, and 
it safeguards individuals who might be vulnerable. And it is about individuals who are vulnerable. They're not quite here, they're not quite there. They're at the cusp of trying to find a way through to all of these challenges. And when there are no structures around these individuals, they're much more likely to fall prey to uh, other uh, 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 factors. So there is something that can hold people back from that. And so, indeed, that is an important element, and that would explain to a significant degree why we just don't see Turkish third, second, fourth generation folks implicated. Um, but it would be perhaps um, too simplistic to just to look at that, because there are positive and negative forces to take into consideration. So we can't negate the external elements, but it's the it's the definite problems of what's happening locally and what's happening to communities here, despite all of these other factors that still are important to, to kind of bear, bear in mind and, and take a greater focus on, as a way into looking at what it is to be a European Muslim and, and, and how that is framed and experienced. So, yeah, I mean, this is again, this, you know, the empowered Muslim world, the empowered Muslim mindsets against uh, extremism, and we could go a long way. In the 1980s, German Kohl was very interested in what's happening in the second generation Turkish, there were 4 million Turkish folks there. Uh, if we're not careful, uh, we're going to lose some of these kids to, to, to gangs, to, to violence, to uh, even to extremism. So maybe what, they, what we need is more Islam. And, and so he spent three years investigating this, but he couldn't actually use it, implement it, because of the political pressures in Germany at the time. And, and I think there is also some understanding that war Islam is good, or the bad thing, and, and, and that that can be provided in a way that uh, is, is functional and systematic. Uh, and, uh, but it, it would mean that this would be also good for majorities as a whole as well, and we just don't see that. And I think that the discourse of being a minority is still so powerful we need a lot more going on, and something at the level of the Turkish organization could be of real value here. And I think if we think about it in absolute terms, there's something there. Yeah. 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 Okay, thanks. Um, the floor is yours. Uh, right. We have a question in the oh, chat. Oh, question in the chat, okay. You can think longer about your question. It's a question from Shalim Tala. How do we explain that among some Muslim diasporas there is more radicalization compared to other Muslims? Oh, thank you uh, for that question, Shalim Tala. I think, uh, I think we just alluded to the, to the last question here, in that there has to be a sort of a balance between ex internal strength and external risk. And where there is internal strength by way of cohesion organization, also including religious organization, but also cultural organization, it's not just purely about religion, because we can see different forces in terms of, for example, the um, uh, jamaat -e islami groups at South Asia, the Muslim Brotherhood groups in uh, Europe, uh, which are quite powerful religious forces at some ideological level, but they don't really have a bearing uh, to the extent that we think they might. So it must be related to a kind of cultural, ethnic, religious cohesion that comes together nicely. If we again specialize uh, our thinking around the Turkish experience, because it is unique relative to other Muslim world experiences when it comes to radicalization. They literally are completely invisible uh, on all of these topics. It's Pakistan is in the UK, Morocco is Belgium, France, the Netherlands, and, um, and other new African groups, for example, also. Lots of white converts uh, are there as well. So how do we explain, uh, well, that's it. We have to look at internal issues and external factors that uh, are important to, to try and think about. And, and, then, and then, still then, there are going to be individual level triggers, because it's always about the individual engaged in extremism. And, and, and every individual who does so has a story that exists over and beyond this uh, issue of just the push and the pull. Hopefully that helps. It's more theoretical abstract framing, but we can think about it uh, uh, and see definite examples as well. I have another question. Yeah, I have a question about um, um, the, the topic as such. Um, so you um, you have this uh, drive project here, and somehow I feel that um, by getting the money, you also become part of this whole industry yes. of which you are critical. Um, so so it, 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 somehow it's very difficult to get away with because you choose this. The topic, so somehow you find it worth 
for a research project, but at the same time, you feel that there is too much emphasis on, on, on this particular, yes. uh, on, on, on this extremism on, among Muslims in Europe. So I just wonder, how do you deal with this? So is it personally, but also in, 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 in getting money, getting funding? Well, we need the funding to do the research, and uh, otherwise it's difficult. We can do small projects all the time, and that's not a problem. We can write books, it's not a problem. But getting the research funding from, in this case, the European Commission, under their radicalization screen, it is not something that's in isolation. For example, the two other projects that are set alongside us, they're all about pluralism and political participation. All come under the, uh, the banner of social exclusion. So there is an understanding that, uh, that social exclusion is important in understanding radicalization. But this is on an ongoing effect because radicalization itself, you can't get 10 radicalization scholars to sit in a room and agree what radicalization is. Uh, uh, and that's okay. I mean, we do this in the academy uh, and in the policy oriented research. And it's also important to, to work within. And I think there's room for all of this within the framing. And there will be orthodox scholars in our realm and our midst, and the same with uh, perhaps even more critical scholars uh, operating within and perhaps like in the, the fringes. And it's all part of the conversation that we need to have. Uh, and, 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 then, and, and even when I engage with policy audiences inside government departments, think tanks, and so on, there's always room for this kind of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it can take, be taken so far, but often gets pushed back by the political mm -hmm. systems and the, the dominant themes of the day. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, if you look at all the research or radicalization in the academy, it tends to be critical, balanced, and empirical in the main. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, there are obviously some personalities who persist with their uh, lines and they become celebrities in their own right, but that, that's just any field. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it, it gives legitimacy to what we want to do and helps us to continue our conversation within the tech yeah. rather than outside. Yeah. No, but the, it's also for me the, the getting funding as such for, for this topic. So uh, what I, uh, I, I never forget, uh, forgot that once uh, Jörn Nielsen in a lecture, I think, it must have been uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, so it was before 9-11, and then he just showed how much funding was going to all kinds of projects on extremism or on uh, Islam and violence. Yeah. So it was rather, uh, it was often on this rather than on other topics. No, I think that's, that's the case. No. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think there's still a dominant uh, thread within this field that, uh, that wants to make a close association between religion and violence. And, but there's also a space, and, and I've been talking about these kinds of things for 20 years, and small projects and so on, and at, the, at one point, yeah, the, the application, the thread, the consortium, we fit it just right. And so it's right place, right time, of course. And now that we're in, and uh, we've started, um, you know, we just need to let the data speak, and. Uh, Hopefully, it will add evidence to what we've been saying, all of us, in our own ways. Historians, I'm talking about who's on the team, historians, criminologists, uh, sociologists, anthropologists, etc., and public mental health clinical psychologists, etc. So we have the opportunity now to really bring something very unique together. And uh, who knows if it'll come around again, this opportunity. But we're in it. Uh, we're in it to win it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question. You talked about the more Islam, and I think this is very interesting. Now from Germany, and then um, um, how would you explain, or what will your opinion be on cities where there's a very strong Muslim community? You know, you mentioned this with Orf, for example, um, while radicalization is one part, and then also clan crime is the other part. Um, so, what would your perspective be on young? Most of them are men, young men, who have perspective or could be provided or are provided with perspective by the state that they could pursue a normal career, yes. but still decide differently. Um, fighting crime as the state with police and enforcing law um, is one side, but also what your perspective be on the psychological and yeah. um, on this side of the whole problem of preventing people to choosing and crime, which is obviously lucrative because you can make a lot of money, but very dangerous. Um, so how do we create young people choosing that to be over a normal career? Good question. Well, I think sometimes it's not always choice. Uh, sometimes these kinds of gangs are uh, because people's lack of choice. 
And obviously there is this kind of immediate gratification that comes with what, what's popularized in terms of gang, gangs and gang, uh, gang violence, i.e. the monetary side of things, the status side of things. These are things that have been lost to people, so they've gone elsewhere to find them. And it's the immediate claiming of this through these gang formations. And a sense of masculinity, a sense of status, a sense of, a sense of belonging that comes with gang membership. And if the state could provide that all the way through normal workings of our social structures, uh, where people you know, get a fair education, fair crack at jobs, fair crack at getting ahead, then we wouldn't need to think about uh, criminality uh, as an opportunity. And, and that's obviously an understanding of how criminality works. It's not really a designer choice. It, it's a lack of choice often. Uh, we try very hard to demonize it. Uh, the, and, uh, and obviously the implications of being part of that world are severe. But it is poor sets of opportunities, poor infrastructure. And it, it's not always a choice. Um, it's far from it. It's the opposite. It's the lack of choice. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, throughout your talk, a, a quote came to my mind. Is that uh, war is the terrorism of, of the rich. And terrorism is the war for the poor. Uh, and you also mentioned the creation of the states of uh, Israel, also. Yeah. So uh, I'm not sure uh, if these theories are also applicable to the state uh, terrorism, you know, like uh, you see now in uh, India, also. Yeah. So in, in how far these uh, pull and push uh, factors can be applicable to uh, states? I think that's a, yeah, state terrorism is a very, very big area. Um, you know, we talk about you know, what's happening in Myanmar, talking about uh, aspects of what's happening in the, in the Israeli state. Overall, we see uh, China and uh, Yanjian province, what's going on there, and using the model of Western imperialism and uh, annihilation there. Uh, this, this is quite a big topic, but it's a separate topic. I think. Mm -hmm. You can't really draw parallels between individual level acts of extremism and terrorism and state terrorism, although there are uh, issues to think about when you think about terrorism per se as a subject, because too often we forget state terrorism as, as a theme, as a concept. And uh, it can be symbolic, uh, it can be structural, uh, everything from cutting off water supply, it, 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 it terrorizes a community, it then incentivizes the motivate, motivates those who are, you say, helpless and powerless. And, and there's only so much that a minority or a particular group can take before they feel they have to respond. And, and, and this is what it was all about when the PLO were carrying out uh, play hijackings in the late 60s and early 70s. Should they be described as a terrorist organization or do they have genuine legitimate concerns? that uh, uh, cannot be addressed in every, any other way. Any other court on the land rejects their appeals, people of Palestine. Then what happens to the people of Palestine? And we're talking about Arab Palestinians, 120 years ago, Palestinians were Jews as well. It's a different kind of geography and history if you think about more historically. So there are these, these kind of global issues related to the Muslims on, on both sides when it comes to foreign policy invasions and, and implications for minority the Muslims there, and the Muslim minorities are in Western Europe and their ideas of identity, sense and belonging, and then people buying into sort of various structure to mobilize problems, uh, ultimately what lead to problems here. Yeah, I think there's a question that you asked, and I'm not sure if I answered it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think that the, this countering violent extremism, uh, is the topic of yours, that uh, does not deal with the uh, State yeah, doesn't, no, it doesn't okay. deal with states. It's a, it, that's the problem. All of that is out of the picture of CBE. It's all about um, these extremists who are, obviously, in this case, European Muslims and people joining the Islamic State. And, uh, and only now there has been some appreciation of the far right just because of the scale of it, and the number of plots, and the number of casualties, etc., and how they've infiltrated in many ways so, so much police security services, for example. And it's almost going to stick on, you know, sort of tacking on to the existing discourse. It's going to take time to evolve and get it right. But state terrorism and um, the violence of the state is not on the agenda. Yes. We have a long question. Long question. Here we go. Wow. Uh,
the way Turkey organizes Islam is still state centric through Vienna. How would this be done in Western countries if we also want to counter a state centric narrative approach? What position could the state take? And are there examples of success if minor? Okay, can the state help for foster the Islamic network? Can, can Western states become a bit more Islamic states? Like, uh, well, training clergy, training yeah. more clergy, that, that is uh, imams. Yeah. Islamic networks are compromised. There is an attempt to make and resources mobilized, mostly with internally from the community, to train, as I say, imams and um, educators and um, try to foster a kind of European Islam, Belgian Islam, British Islam. And, and that's an inevitable process. It's going to have to happen. Uh, it should have happened a long time ago. And as I say, in the 1980s, the early 90s, Herbert Kohl had a plan to do this, precisely before it was shelved. And it tells you that, there has, that there's this element that we have to not ignore, that there is a population growth. The Muslim population is not going to take over. It's, going to take, it's never going to happen. In our lifetimes, for sure, but there is an increase in the population relative to the majority of the populations with birth rates. Urban areas, as we mentioned, parts of Germany and so on. It's not that people choose to be there. This is where the jobs were. This is where the, when the factories closed down, these people were stuck because they couldn't go out anywhere else because they couldn't get the incomes to. There were also discrimination issues in the, in the housing markets, etc. And then people also feel a sense of comfort. The Balfour Chairs, mosques, the Islamic centers, wedding halls, a sense of security, safety. That is perhaps denied elsewhere. Um, you see mid class Muslims moving far away enough, but not so far away, so that they're not away from the private prayers or their relatives or their friends or the shopping and so on. So, geography and space and identity are also interesting. Right? And if we really think about which group is the most segregated, it's the majorities, of course, simply because of the numbers. The minorities are maximum 10% in all of these countries and across well, Western Europe, of which half are approximately Muslim. So, um, we need some kind of understanding and appreciation, but we're a long way from that when we still, every day, in the political landscape, demonize this place of Islam. We use that language when we, when we think we need it to help us politically, and I'm talking about the mainstream political parties. And this is gone, we sometimes think, it's okay, we'll get back to something normal, but ever since the war on terror, and ever since the financial crisis, and then now, even during COVID, um, uh, when we come out of COVID, it's going to be business as usual, unless something significant changes in order. We have another nice uh, oh, maybe from, uh, from the room then yeah. maybe yeah. this is what urgent question yeah, yeah. Urgent is a big a question <laughs> and then we take the one there yeah. so that this variation in yeah, the dynamics in interaction <laughs> it's a good question there about far right extremes yeah the so we take that for a lot uh, oh, oh sorry, sorry. Maybe, uh, sorry. Uh, okay. yeah please um, I think what I'm struggling to understand a bit is how do you conceptually grasp that we, a lot of your explanations of radicalization in Central Europe deals with like the, the minority situation yes. in Europe, discrimination in the yes. and so on. Yes. But how do you conceptually grasp that this is a like the Islamization of radicalization, as you like yes. mentioned in one slide, it's a it's a phenomenon that concerns the whole Islamic world, right? Yes. How do you conceptualize that? Okay, so when these cases of the Muslim minorities experience these problems, they were talking about identity loss, status loss, exclusion, disadvantage, alienation. It's not too dissimilar from, from what's happening in Iraq, Syria. Add to that corruption, nepotism, tribalism, militarism, uh, development issues, uh, urban, rural, periphery issues. Uh, and then you've got the same set of factors, but just, in, just on turbo. Uh, and then the, with the bull factors acting as a way to, to uh, mobilize against those issues. So in some cases, all those Tunisian young men who joined the Islamic State at first did so because uh, it was a job. Uh, it, was a, it was an opportunity to help the Sunni brothers against Assad. Then the Islamic State turned into evil death machine that they ultimately became. Um, and some people went into that knowingly, of course, as well. And they had agency and had, they, they knew what they were doing to a greater extent. And yes, there are some people who are going to have very hard news, but they've been formed in these landscapes in Europe. In as much as we see the problems in, say, Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and, and throughout South Asia and throughout Southeast Asia. And again, in Southeast Asia, there are hundreds of millions of Muslims, and yet the cases are so, so small, uh, so, so few, rather, in terms of going to Islamic State, even in terms of, it's a word recently on uh, migrant workers in Bangladesh. It's literally a handful of cases, and it was literally like 50 cases in the last five years. 
So uh, it, it's not a massive scale, of course, and this is also part of the whole industry of radicalization. You blow it up, it, it's big money for the security sectors, the, the, the de radicalization sectors, the counter terror state, if you like. And um, the reality is that if a lot of that could be shifted into community development and empowerment, a sense of belonging and exclusion, uh, inclusion rather than exclusion across the board. You know, this is not a happy, shiny, let's all be nice to each other solution, but we need some of that as well. And we don't have that in a world that's deeply polarized, deeply divided, deeply unequal, and going further in those directions. Oh, yes, the Great Wall Street, uh, in terms of the far right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not uh, looking at that, but there is this element of uh, the radicalization of the far right among Turkish diaspora communities. It's an interesting case study, and a fascinating paper to be written on that has been written already, but it's not something I know about. And, um, and uh, it has come up actually the question. Uh, our situation in parts diasporic communities like the migration background from in this case extreme secular um, right wing folks. It would be a very interesting case study. I definitely wanted to explore that funding. So thank you for the question. So that's a new research agenda there. <laughs> okay, so before we say a lot of things here of, 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 of all the factors that may explain radicalization, uh, on one which one do you bet your money? Well, I'm going to use the word exclusion and inclusion. So if we can think about inclusion, we can think about the sense of, so all the parameters in relation to inclusion. If we get that right, I think we're going to get very far ahead with, with, with eliminating the problems of that. So if, if you write a recent proposal mm -hmm. on inclusion, put your letter. Yes. I, I will have the chances. <laughs> yeah. I'll probably um, review it. <laughs> thank you very much again. Uh, here, Professor Abbas, uh, we are very lucky, and also the ones who have followed it from home, uh, to be able to pick the brains of one of the brightest, one of the brightest minds on this topic at this moment. And we're very happy that you are delighted, and we'll be here for, for, for hopefully a very long time and do your research. And we look forward for your next lecture, next book, and uh, next talk with you. Thank you very much, also for coming. Thank you for everyone attending at home. Next week, there's another Lucid lecture. It will be on our very previous vice chancellor. Two days ago, it was 100 years ago, it became vice chancellor of the universities.